Good afternoon, everyone. Time for this week's silver update. We are looking at the daily chart, and as I point out before, our MACD is reset to the lowest point since the 2008 low and before. So, combined with the fact that we are still above this trend line, that's a bullish sign. We're fairly significantly above it and hopefully we get a bounce and start to rally here so the trend is still intact the trend channel is still intact and so we just want to wait and see how this works itself out we may get lower prices if we do get lower prices it's going to be an opportunity to buy more because ultimately silver is going much higher than it is right now just based on the fundamentals. We're going to get into those as we do part three of FOFOA's silver article. I wanted to jump over to a site that I was given a tip on. It's Westminster Mint and they do have some pretty good buys. I don't know how many they have left, probably not too many. On the Canadian Timberwolf and on the Grizzly, we also have rolls of Grizzly, so they must have quite a few of the Grizzlies. They don't have rolls of the Timberwolves. The price is forty-one twenty-one, which is a pretty good deal. I mean, we're at that's six above spot, but as I've shown you, these coins are going from fifty to sixty dollars. Both of these coins, so you could turn a quick profit if you wanted to sell them on eBay or if you just wanted something that has got numismatic value these are a real good deal so we'll see how long those last let's look at our SLV volume you can see that we were falling we actually fell below a hundred thousand shares for the first time in a number of weeks ever since the massive sell-off took place and with this intermediate top that we had here around 39 or so the SLV sells at about a dollar discount so the SLV topped at around 37.90 that's about 39 on the spot silver and then the volume came right back up we did 150, 183 and 117 so we're still trading hundreds of millions of shares of SLV which is one ounce and then we've also got all the COMEX volume so as I point out in other updates the the volume is ridiculous it's absurd the short position is ridiculous and absurd it's uh, it's unprecedented there's no other market like it and uh, I favored an interview with Eric Sprott where uh, Max Kaiser interviews him and uh, he he mentions some of the ridiculous volumes that we're seeing that's obviously paper silver and a paper manipulation so let's jump over to our option and if you remember we had the July 25 put and we still have about 125,000 open interest so that hasn't really decreased just some churning the price dropped 13 cents, so we're down to 43.46. About still a three, three to four hundred percent profit from where it was purchased, around eight and nine cents, when that initial mil, uh, million dollar purchase of those options was made. So we'll just keep following this one. If silver doesn't continue to dramatically fall, then time decay is going to come and wipe this out down to zero. So let's jump back to FOFOA and. Costatus's silver forum. If you remember the last time we talked about it, we talked about the amount of above ground silver that can come back on. He was talking about the flow, and I pointed out that I disagreed with him that there is a very large amount of silverware, old silver coins, and based on inflation adjusted prices, I think that we're going to be looking at in the hundreds of dollars an ounce for any of this to start flowing so I disagree with him on that but let's continue on with the fundamentals he says will the silver stock flow 
I hope we can agree that the answer is no, unless the price is high enough to overcome sentimental attachment or individual owners that the silver experience that silver experience a sharp decline in their income and or standard of living. So, for the purpose of this story, we are assuming the bulk of the above ground silver stock is not mobile at the present time, no immediate threat to a corner operator. This wrap up of the silver silver survey by Mindweb says last year's world silver fabrication demand grew 12.8% to 878 million ounces, according to Eric Sprott. In 2010, the total supply of mined and scrapped silver amounted to 950 million ounces. We'll take Sprott's figure as the size of the flow that is central to the story of a market cornered. In passing, I would also like to point out that when analysis analysts talk of consumption of silver, they should mean total industrial demand minus recycling. This silver is consumed insofar as not financially viable to reclaim it at present. Other holders of silver variously hoard, wear, or utilize it in some way, but it is not consumed it remains of the above ground stock. While the stock remains immobile, this non-consumption demand also competes for the flow with the consumers of silver, industrial silver users. Another issue I hope we can agree upon is that silver, like a host of other commodities, has been and remains in a commodities bull market. Primary trend since 2002-03 has been upward. Within that upward trend, there's been lots of price volatility and potential profits for a savvy trader on both the up and down price moves. A corner operator could have dramatically increased their profits by accentuating the moves in both directions. The central theme of this narrative is that mark is of market manipulation, not price suppression. Silver price suppression. The belief in a scheme to suppress the price of silver is pervasive among silver bugs. If suppressing the price of silver was the sole objective of a silver market manipulator, then my narrative collapses. You will see why shortly. So before we proceed further, a few brief remarks to the suppression camp. Analysts such as Ted Butler have been sounding suppression, the suppression klaxon since 1989. He links an article by Butler back then. But I ask, why look for a complicated explanation when supply and demand offers a simple, perfectly adequate explanation. And he is pointing to a link to the Silver Eagle, which started being minted in 1986 and has steadily increased in volume since then. I'm not sure how this addresses his point. It, later, he begins to connect it with the drawdown of the stockpile, but I, I'm still not really seeing his point. I don't see how supply and demand gives a perfect explanation of why the price of silver was low. Perhaps he's just saying that until the stockpile ran out, then there's no reason for the price of silver to rise, but then again, isn't selling off a stockpile into any rise, isn't that suppression anyway? So we'll... we'll Look at that in a second here. Throughout the period, such sell-offs that did occur, as well as announcements of planned sell-offs, caused immediate declines in the price of silver. Indeed, the Wall Street Journal reported in September 1976, when the U.S. government makes noises about selling silver from the federal stockpile, futures traders start unloading futures contracts in speculation that such a sale would depress prices. Silver was a natural short play in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. There were collectively huge amounts of silver overhanging the market in the form of old coins, national reserves, public and private stockpiles. That silver stock was mobile. The low price of silver over many decades had also made primary silver mines uneconomic. The silver that did come from the miners was mainly a byproduct of the pursuit of other ores. Hence, the silver was extracted and sold with little regard to the price of silver. All in all, a short seller's dream come true. I would argue that in 2002 was the watershed year for all silver, the year when the U.S. defense national stockpile was nearing depletion as a result of the Silver Eagle coin program. That opened the way in 2003 for silver to join the long cycle commodity uptrend along with other industrial metals, agricultural commodities, and so on. This in turn created the opportunity for a well-resourced trader to safely play either the long side or the short side of the silver market without fear of a sudden influx of the metal. In this story, the end of the supply overhang also opened the way for an attempt 
to corner the flow of physical silver as the remaining stock was becoming increasingly immobile while demand from industrial users was growing strongly. Ted Butler, and to be fair many others, allege massive naked shorting on the silver comics. Ted lays out his case here. From what I have read, it appears that Ted's narrative that in, in Ted's narrative, this massive naked short position is held primi primarily by J.P. Morgan and perhaps HSBC. This is how Ted's tale ends. The COMEX shorts will be chased over the cliff by the longs in a massive short covering squeeze, like these bison. And he gives an example of how the Indians hunted bison by running them off a cliff. I want to be up front with you. I think Ted and his cohorts may prove to be dead wrong, and he puts this in emphasis. Finding themselves in a role reversal, falling headfirst with the bison and anyone else beguiled by their story. We will return to Ted's story a little later when we consider the lack of transparency in the silver market and why the circumstantial evidence suggests that Ted and his cohorts are dead wrong. Now, this begins to get at the essence of his argument. I want to point this out to you because it's so important. We don't see him arguing against Ted's facts. What we see him beginning to intimate here is that if things work out the way Ted Butler expects them to, with a mass covering short squeeze, then everyone's going over the cliff, including the longs in silver. Now, how's that going to happen? Well, obviously, that can't happen unless silver's outlawed or it's confiscated or the tax laws change or it's declared a national security issue, something like that. So you really want to note here, this is the beginning of his argument, and we're going to deal with this in the next, the next episodes here, that he's not addressing Ted's arguments of how the manipulation has taken place, why the manipulation has taken place. He's just simply implying that Ted's wrong about how it's going to turn out. So it doesn't even seem that he disagrees with Ted Butler in theory at all, and we're going to find out later when he explains, but it's a little bit disturbing that he says that Ted and his cohorts may prove to be dead wrong. Almost like a threat. So, makes you wonder, who is this FOFOA guy? Who is he working for? Who is Costada? And what's their motive in writing this? Are they trying to scare silver bulls? Are they really countering their story? Or are they trying to bring a different twist to this plot? So we will look at that in part four. And we'll talk to you next time.